They were like, are you an actor now? I was like, no, they just like, they cast yeah, anybody. Yeah, yeah. What, and you I, think all the Asian people look alike? Yeah, yeah and that's what I said. Like, like, oh, I'm like, <laughs> they're like, no, they're like, I was like, wait, just because he's Asian? So you think yeah, that's yeah. me? And you're they're like, like, no. Yeah, you're gaslighting all yeah, Exactly. Friends. What are the Chinese comedians making of the Drake Kendrick beef? Oh my God. Um... <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to Tea Time with Jesse. I'm your host, Jesse, here today with Yi Jin Chun. Wow. Yes. Uh, it was an actor, uh, Canadian Chinese, and wow. uh, a friend of, my agent Ike, mm -hmm. uh, who recommended that you were coming through for a uh, for a uh, short film short, short film festival, festival. Exactly, yeah. and so I was like, why not have him on the podcast? It's really good to have you here. Uh, why don't you give everybody a little quick introduction? Who are you? Cool. So uh, I want to give a shout out first because this yeah. is actually going to be my first show, first podcast ever. Oh, oh wow! There we go. Yeah. We go. So what does it feel like? Are you are you nervous? Are you excited? No, like you've been great. So it's been like very um, welcoming. So that's yeah. been I feel very relaxed, um, comfortable. Uh, yeah, I want to give a shout out to. My mom, yeah. my dad, my sister, I love it. Um, who else? My grandma who passed away this summer, so oh. she's probably with Guan Yin right now yeah. watching. Uh, my friends and fa other family and friends who don't know I'm acting, which we can discuss. Okay. Are, is it a secret? A kind of. Secret? So there's some friends that know I'm acting okay. and some friends that don't because I want to surprise them. Oh, okay. Uh, and then also my wonderful girlfriend, Federica, and her family who's probably going to be watching this in Italy. So. Oh, that's amazing. Dude, yeah. I have to say, you're the first person who came on and dropped so many shout outs oh, from really? the beginning <laughs> of the show. I love it though. It's like, that's why we're here, man. We're here exactly. to have a good time with everybody. Um, for, for you, just let you know, my audience are all yeah. tea people. Um, you know, people who are interested in Chinese culture, mm -hmm. people who are interested in tea culture, and um, people who are just here to have a good time and mm -hmm. be able to learn about interesting new stuff. So, yeah. um, we're going to start off today uh, by making Sister Eyes Everyday Red Tea. The box is a little bit beat up because it's actually my own personal one I've been going through mm -hmm. slowly. Um, we get this from uh, Yunnan. Oh, okay. So we have the, uh, they're pressed into these little cakes. Yeah. And then um, this is ancient tree red tea. Right. Um, and you can see here the- uh, Can I smell it? Yeah, tea leaves are really nice there. Like I, really, I don't really smell it. The, uh, yeah, so the, uh, the actual like just plain tea oftentimes will have no scent. Okay. A lot of times the tea that's sold in the West has been like sprayed with fragrant oil. Uh, so it's like jasmine tea, but to make it smell really jasmine-y, they uh, they spray it with oil, okay. but that actually is not as good as the as the actual fragrance of the tea once it's made. Once the tea gets um, hot, you'll actually be able to smell That's, a little oh, bit okay. more of the, uh, of the tea scent. So just break off a little piece of this, mm -hmm. and then the red tea is what in the West is called black tea. Yeah. So if um if, like the Lipton or whatever is a black tea, this is the sort exactly. of thing. Okay. But this is going to be better than the better than that brand. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the rules are on on YouTube if they let me smash other brands or if I'm going to get blasted. I don't know. We're not here to bash them. We're here to enjoy. Lipton tea is good. The, the tea. No, yeah. we didn't. No, we didn't pay for yeah. a body. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they got to pay me if we're going to say that on the podcast. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, so the um, uh, it's your first time in LA. What have you thought yeah. of LA so far? Um, so I arrived uh, just two days ago, and mm -hmm. so far it's been really nice. Mm -hmm. um, we went to Irvine. Yep. And then Newport Beach, Laguna Beach. Nice. Um, staying at a hotel in Torrance right now. Nice. Uh, and so far it's been, yeah, like the, the weather mm -hmm. has been really, really nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, this morning there was an earthquake. There was an, er an earthquake this morning. Um, how did, did you feel the earthquake? I did. So I mm -hmm. set my alarm for seven mm -hmm. and then I was like, okay, maybe I could smell I that. I can smell it now. Yeah. Mm, really seven nice. and I was like, okay, maybe I'll sleep in and then for a little bit longer and it's 7.30. Mm -hmm the room started shaking. And I wasn't worried because I know like there's like earthquake, but I was like, oh, when is oh, it going to stop? Yeah. And then I checked my phone and there's like, you, you guys have Google alerts yeah. for um, earthquake as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, that's my first earthquake experience actually, nice. I think. So well, we all we all made it through. That is one of the things I keep sometimes think about is like, oh, like my parents actually mm -hmm. were visiting San Francisco while uh, my mom was pregnant with me, uh, thinking about whether they should move to San Francisco, and they were looking for houses the day the earthquake hit, uh, and the big earthquake that like wrecked San Francisco, and they were like, no, we're going to the East Coast. <laughs> like, uh, we don't okay, want to deal okay, with this. Okay. Um, this the deal first, with the steep, cold yeah. rather than the earthquake. Exactly. This first uh, steep is a wash, okay. so this allows us to open up the leaves. <laughs> um, what's your kind of tea experience? Because I know you come from, a, you say your Cantonese background. Yeah, is that Cantonese right? background. So my mom's from uh, Jiangxi. Okay. And then my dad's from Hong Kong. Okay. Um, and then I was born and raised in uh, Toronto. And yes. 
So most of my tea experience is just going to have uh, yum cha with my grandparents yeah, yeah. and family. So usually it's just like uh, drinking uh, bole, pu'er. like bo'er, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. oolong, and um, what else? Like uh, in Cantonese is gok fa cha, uh, chrysanthemum. Yeah, yeah, kui hua. Uh, yeah, kui hua. Uh, kui hua. Uh, kui, uh, say mo li hua would be um, jasmine. Chrysanthemum is uh, ju hua. Ji, ju hua. Uh, yeah, ju hua cha. Ju hua. Okay, yeah. Mm. And that's basically, and then I'll drink it because it, you know, growing up, I don't really drink tea or coffee much, mm -hmm. um, so I don't really have like a tea tea background. So yeah, that's but just good. only for dim sum. Basically. Well, welcome. Here you go. See what we, see we like Thank about this much. one. Yes, cheers, cheers, everybody. Cheers. Mm, pretty good. It's nice and light, right? Yeah. So this is like you know light, sweet in the beginning, kind of more floral. Mm. As it opens up, it's going to even get darker. So when you like say open up, it means like when you keep pouring more. Yeah, because so the tea leaf is um, it's dried. Yeah. Um, if you have a tea bag that's like all powder, then it'll instantly like everything oh, okay. gets inundated at once, and right. so that's why they're kind of like over astringent, over over punchy mm -hmm. kind of like it's not very well balanced. The actual tea leaves when you have the whole leaf it gets slowly inundated with the water. Okay. So the, the beginning and the second steep and the third steep and the fourth steep and the fifth steep, they all have this like progression. Oh, okay, okay. And so as we go through it, it's gonna be changing subtly, going from kind of um, like kind of more light and sweet into darker mm -hmm. and then kind of fading off again towards okay. the end. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. Yeah, it's good, it's mm -hmm. good, yeah. Because um, usually when I drink tea, I'm like, oh, it's so bitter, like mm, right off the bat. Yeah, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be bitter. Like the uh, like with a couple minor exceptions of mm -hmm. teas that are like the the calling card is being right, bitter. Right. Most of the time, tea being bitter is a sign it's poor quality. Uh, and right. a lot of the tea that got to the West was brought there. Um, and then it was bitter and then we're like, oh, add milk, add sugar. Right. Uh, and then people started adding milk and adding sugar and the varietals of tea that grow best in the British colonies mm -hmm. in India and Kenya and Sri Lanka in those places mm -hmm. uh, were varietals that were more strong and more bitter to begin oh, with. Okay, okay. So in China, where it's more varietals that are kind of lighter and sweeter, mm -hmm. Um, generally, as you see, we're not adding any tea right, or milk exactly. or sugar. So. That's why I found it so strange when sometimes uh, some of my friends, mm -hmm. they drink tea with like the add sugar yeah yeah and i'm like i've never had it's, tea like yeah that. and i mean there are people i mean obviously like you know taiwan uh, uh, uh hong kong has uh, like milk tea right right and right. there's like there are lots of different combinations so it's not saying like if you drink sugar in your tea it's bad yeah it's right, like right. but it is saying that the leaves if you're going to be adding stuff in general, you don't need as much high quality stuff. It's almost like cocktails. It's mm -hmm. like if you have really, really good whiskey, mm -hmm. you don't like add Coca-Cola to it. Right. Um, you, it, like there's a level of which where it's like, OK, this isn't the best whiskey, but it'll do totally fine right, as a right. mixer. Um, it's, it's almost like Italian food, right? Like the yeah, simple yeah. ingredients and then it's like fresh. Yeah. You taste the freshness, exactly. like tomatoes and stuff. Exactly. So Understood. cheers. Here cheers, we go. Cheers. So you're from Toronto. Mm -hmm. And um, I got a chance to perform in Toronto, I'd yes. say like two years ago. Yes, um, I saw that, yeah. It was a lot of fun. I did, I did crosstalk with Dashan. If mm -hmm. anyone knows Dashan, you can go check out the, uh, the video blog I did of that. But the, um, I was amazed at how many Chinese people there were in Toronto. Yeah. I knew there were a lot, but I didn't realize how many there were. What's the Chinese community like? So uh, <laughs> recently, I actually saw like a, a YouTube video of like a, a Miami vlogger in yeah. Markham. Yeah. And then that's when I started looking it up again. And Toronto, like the greater Toronto area, actually mm -hmm. has the second largest Chinese population uh, in North America. Wow. And actually, when I dig, dug deeper, and I could be wrong about this, it actually has the second largest, maybe outside of Asia. Wow. Uh, first being New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, New York. I wouldn't doubt it. Um, and close second or like third would be like the LA area. Yeah. So it's, it's basically, it's like Americans saying, oh, there's a lot of Chinese people in the LA area. Really, there's just as many, if not more. Yeah, in Toronto, in, Toronto, in the Toronto area. Also and, in, in a smaller country, like, you know, Canada right, right, doesn't right. have as, like, you know, the population isn't as big. Yeah, exactly. Like in America, I think there's about 4.7 uh, American Chinese and there's like 1.7 mm -hmm. uh, million Canadian Chinese, but the population, like the ratio is like much higher in, yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. Canada. Uh, and also a big population out in Vancouver as well. So yep. in Toronto, we have Markham mm -hmm. and in Vancouver, they have Richmond, which yep. a lot of like Chinese people live. Yeah. Uh, most of the Chinese people in Toronto is like Cantonese people. Mm. Uh, actually, they came in waves in the very mm. beginning, like in the 70s. Uh, most of uh, the Mandarin speaking people were from Taiwan. Mm. And then uh, then you have like a lot of like um, 
the, what we call low IQ mm. uh, from Guangdong area, yeah. like Taoshan, mm. uh, that have lived in Canada for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then you have like the 70s, 80s of the Hong Kong people moving. Yeah. And then when I was growing up in the 90s and 2000s, there were a lot more like middle class mainland Chinese moving yeah. to Toronto, mostly from, from like Tianjin. Yeah. And then when I was in university, then you have like a bunch of like international students. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a big mix. It's, now yeah. it's a big mix, yeah. yeah. Whereas before it was like, okay, like it's like, people from Taiwan, yeah. people from Hong Kong, or people from like Guangdong area. Now yeah. it's like, now when I meet people, there are people from Shandong, uh, yeah. Yunnan as well, yeah. where we got the tea. Um, uh, yeah, so like, and uh, Sichuan as yeah. well. It's one of these things where like, a lot of times friends of mine are like, oh, you speak Chinese, do you do like shows in Chinatown? And I was like, well actually like the <laughs> Chinatown Chinese exactly. in Boston are from this wave, exactly, and the, exactly. my audience is from that wave. And like, it gets really specific. Exactly, yeah. They, because they just lump in, oh, Chinese, so it's like they all speak yeah. like... How much of what you just said would you say a non-Chinese Canadian knows? Like none of it? <laughs> or I, I, think, <laughs> like, I think even a lot of uh, Canadian-born Chinese don't really know. Mm. Um, it's just that I'm very interested in Chinese culture. Mm. So I, I just like to research. And then when I, whatever I research, I also, also send it to my friends mm. to let them know. To make sure they're still in touch kind with their re culture. Kind of re-educating. Yeah, exactly. Just letting them know like, hey, this is what's going on in China. This is what's mm. going on in Hong Kong. Mm. Um, here are some fun things that I found on Douyin yeah. to show them. Oh, that's fun. Um, and then just like telling them a bunch of stuff that's happening. And then also like when I visit my girlfriend in Italy, mm. there's a huge uh, Chinese population there as well. Oh, you got to let me know. I'm going to Italy in October. Like if I'm going to... Oh, yeah. are you? Okay, I don't okay. know when this airs, but I may already be back by now. But oh, Okay, um, okay. If, if I am already back, thank you. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, like you know, we're not time travelers. Uh, no. If you do um, go, I, there's yeah, someone yeah. I know who's uh, Italian who's very into Chinese cultures. Like mm. she's very, and there's an air. So you know, here we have in Toronto, there's a Markham. There's yeah. like a Markham in Italy outside of Florence called Prado. I don't know if oh, you've heard really? of it. I mean, I don't know. So I, a lot of like the things that are made mm. in uh, like kind of like some of the high quality brands. Yep. There are actually a lot of them. Uh, from what I've read, or mm -hmm. made in Prado oh. from China, by Chinese people. Oh, so it's like made in, it, sometimes it's so like made, even in, the made in Italy, Italy it's still made Chinese, Chinese. Yeah, <laughs> no matter of. how deep you dig. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's turtles all the way down. So I got <laughs> to meet, meet her because I actually reached out to her through Instagram. I didn't know who mm. she was, but I just saw some Italian person with just like, they call yeah, yeah. themselves China nerds. Yeah, that's and, funny. And uh, just like, they, they, they don't get paid or anything. They just really love Chinese culture. That's cool. And then that's when I found out that Italy has like about 300,000 Chinese people. That's a lot there. more than I thought there would be. Right. And a lot of them are actually from Winzhou. Oh, okay. So yeah. That's cool. Whereas in London, it's like yeah. Hong, like Hong, uh, Hong Kong, like Cantonese. Yeah, so Cantonese. it's just like such a huge yeah, diverse. Yeah, Winzhou people. Claire, uh, our, our, uh, our um, uh, the, the leader of our Chinese department of our the tea company, who is my friend from doing bilingual improv way back in the day mm -hmm. and now works for the tea company is from Wenzhou. Ah, um, okay. And it's funny, they have a joke actually about Wenzhou that I do in China, which is it's funny, in, in China, the Wenzhou knees are known as the Jews of China. Oh, because they, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. so they do business. They do business. And so I have friends, like I went to Wenzhou yeah. and, and people are like, oh, ni hui jiao like, no, like, oh, you're home. Okay, I'm okay, like, okay. Oh, okay, I don't know like where this came from, but. I, I, yeah, like yeah. Wenzhou and also a lot of Fujian because I yeah. think they're by the, the coast, right? Yeah, so yeah, So it's yeah. easy for them to travel very, and uh, very cool. do business, yeah. Well, so what uh, what makes you as sort of a, you know, your, so your parents were from mainland and then from Hong Kong, yeah. and then you were born in Canada. Exactly, yeah. So you you would call yourself second generation or first generation? So yeah, second generation. Okay. I thought I was first generation until people from um, like Korean mm -hmm. from who were the ones who told me in university, mm -hmm. no, you're considered second gen because mm -hmm. you're first your gen is the immigrant. Gen. Yeah, and I was, it was, yeah, so it's, so second gen, so, of this generation, uh, like, what is the the like what is the level of knowledge about China that people have? Does it go from like oh, absolutely none to like very much still tied in, or I how think does it go? I you have such a like diverse mm. um, kind of range. Mm. Um, I would say uh, me and a few others are kind of like in a minority who really know, mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm also in a minority for one that was born in uh mm -hmm. outside of china because you have some that were maybe born in china who came when they were like five or six yeah um who are still who have more knowledge yeah. about like china uh i'm sure i'm not the only one but like a, among my friend group i'm the one mm -hmm. that really um still s stays connected because i think mm -hmm. i went to um 
Mandarin classes. Mm, yeah, you had you had like Chinese school. Chinese school, and I was forced to do it, which is yeah. I really I appreciate my parents for really. Oh, it's good. It's good you came out of that with a good mentality. Yes, yes. I know people that have done the opposite. Same with uh, Jewish people. Like there's a Hebrew school. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. have to learn how to read and write. Although it's harder in Chinese to learn how to read and write mm -hmm. um, because of the characters. Right, right. But um, it is it is a lot of work, and it's um you know the funniest thing now is because I have this audience online of people that know me as like a, a Chinese performer. Right. Um, I actually get invitations sometimes from Chinese schools to come and talk oh, to the kids yeah, and, yeah. and get them hyped about learning Chinese. Yeah. And I'm like, the world is so twisted now. Right, right, <laughs> like right, yeah, they're right, getting, exactly. they're calling in the white guy to get the the, yeah. the Asian American or Canadian children hyped about learning Chinese. Yeah, I mean, hey, like they're probably like, hey, if he does it, you guys have yeah, to learn like, it. Yeah, they're like, yeah, exactly, like, you exactly. You got to be able to do it. So. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. What, what is it like in Chinese school? Like p portal yourself back to being a kid. How old were you? What do you have to do in Chinese school? Right. So, um, the Chinese school I went to, uh, was actually taught by people from Taiwan. Okay. So I had to learn, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but that yeah. was so difficult for me to learn. Mm. Uh, I, even now I still don't really know how to use e explain it. Explain what Bopamotha is to people that don't so know. So it's kind of like a, a system that Taiwan developed in order to recognize uh, traditional Chinese characters and even I, I also it's like a phonetic way to like speak mm -hmm. the, the characters yeah um, and there's like three on the side of the Chinese characters that mm -hmm. have like that allows you to pronounce the words yeah uh, from it's, what I remember yeah, like, yeah. it could be something. It, it's like um, like in in Japanese they have like kanji which right. are the characters but then they yeah, also the, have katakana exactly, which is the, the other two yeah the sounding out of the thing exactly yeah um, and so I was put into it in uh, since uh, kindergarten so I, when I was four years old me and my sister uh, we were through it till about maybe when I was in grade eight that's when we stopped mm -hmm. um, and in between, I went to like a different, also by another Taiwan teacher. Hmm. Um, and that's when she taught me uh, Hanyun Pinyin. Yeah, Pinyin. And yeah. I was like, Pinyin is so much easier. Yeah. Ni hao, N-I-H-A-O. Yeah. I was like, that's brilliant. And I, yeah. I didn't realize that at, at the end, that's what the mainland people use is the pinyin. Yep. And Taiwan people don't, of course, some would yep. know, but that's not They common. use the Wade Giles. It's like, it's a whole, it's a deep stew. Some people asked about this. They were asking me, why is Puar sometimes spelled P U E R H, yeah. and other times it's P U with the apostrophe, apostrophe E R, e -R. Yeah. and this is because like throughout the history of China, like they've they've always struggled to like how do we modernize yeah. but also keep the characters. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And ironically, it took until the computer to really figure that out yeah. because you should if you've never seen old Chinese typewriters, search up. Chinese character typewriters. They're the size of like, you know, boardroom tables mm. and they have like thousands of characters on them. And that was like, people made all sorts of attempts to be able to use the characters. Wow, okay, I didn't know that Yeah, oh, it's crazy. Like they have like each die, like we have A, B, C. Yeah. They have like each character. Right, and right. you need to remember where you stored each of the characters. Yeah, crazy, and there's yeah. whole like, you know, boxes of, of metal dies and yeah. one of these things takes up a room. It's crazy. And that's why they like, yeah. for the longest time, it was like Peking and then Beijing. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. which one? Is, yeah. And I thought maybe because Peking is closer to Cantonese, Bucking. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, maybe that's why it's like they use Peking. Yeah. But yeah, it's, the, whole, it's the a, Y Giles. It's, it's a thing. So yeah, the opinion and Wade Giles. Anyway, all of this stuff is to say, like, I think a lot of, a lot of people like don't recognize how hard it is to keep that going in a second yeah, generation. Yeah. Like I see, um, I know a couple American families that, uh, you know, people that met in China, they had kids in mm -hmm, China. Mm -hmm. They raised essentially American kids in China, for right. lack of a better term. It's hard to know what you call them. Here we have Chinese Americans. They don't have American Chinese. Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> it would be like, wait, is he yeah. Chinese? Or well, no? so that, that that's sort of similar thing. And it was, um, you know, it, it's you you look and you think about it like, ah, oh, how would you raise an American kid in China if mm. you really want them to be American right, still? Right, right, what does right. that mean? But this is a regular everyday occurrence for Asian families yes, exactly. that come over to, exactly. to Canada or to America. Do you feel like your family, it was very important to them that yes. you remain Chinese? Yes, so um, they wanted to make sure, well, first of all, they want to make sure I'm Canadian as well to assimilate with the Canadian mm -hmm. culture and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I noticed it yeah, yeah. tasted like different now. Yeah, it's getting you... darker. Mm. It's getting kind of uh, more body in the tea. Um, uh, it's like stronger in a way too, right? Yep, I'm more punchy. There's a little mustiness in there. <laughs> That's the ancient tree. Oh, uh, okay, okay. A lot of depth to it. But yeah. Um, you're, you're... So yeah, like they want to make sure I, I'm Canadian. So I never, so I did get to experience like, you know, being like like a, what a typical Canadian would experience. Mm -hmm. um, but also it was very important for me to be Chinese as well. Mm -hmm. And actually when I was in Chinese school, the Taiwan teachers, 
it wasn't so later on that I realized the book that I was reading was actually talking about like being proud to be Chinese as well. Mm. I still remember the very first book in grade one that we had mm. to the first page was like, is that 我是中国人, 我是海外的中国人, mm. 我爱中国, oh, wow. 我也爱本地的国家. <laughs> oh, wow. And then the, and at the time, I didn't know anything what, what's, what was happening. And then the picture was a picture of an island and then mm. like a bigger island yeah. <laughs> and of the Chinese kids waving to each other. Mm. And then I was like, oh, and that's why at, at the time, I just thought I was Chinese. I didn't, yeah. know, I didn't, know, I didn't know there were uh, teachers from like Taiwan, but they mm. were trying to make sure that we still remembered our Chinese roots and yeah. identities and stuff. Or yeah, Mandarin. Yeah. Um, so. it, it's it's interesting. It's like it's um, uh, the more I speak to Chinese people, the more I relate as a Jewish person. Like Jews have also, you know, up until you know 1949, didn't have a homeland for 2,000 years. Right. And so the entirety of being Jewish was being Jewish while also being somewhere else, right. where other people were not like you. Right. Right. And a lot of the traditions kind of uh, emerged you know, over thousands of years yeah, of yeah. like every different, the, the, the Jews in Spain did it one way and the yeah. Jews in Eastern Europe did right. it one way and the Jews in Ethiopia did right. it another way. And uh, there were Jews in, in uh, India yeah. and there were, there were everywhere. Because I read um, there's like, like Ashkenazi, yeah. there's like different, there's like, all sorts so, of different Jews. I and thought so, even I, yeah. before I like dove deep into it, you know, when yeah, you go yeah. on Wikipedia, you click, yeah, yeah. click, click. There's been some Wikipedia holes yeah. and that I'm that like, dug into. <laughs> wow, there's so many different like groups. And yeah. then, like, yeah, so. It's, and so I think it's similar, like, you know, that's why it's, you know, we've had Chinese Americans on the show before, but I, we haven't had any Chinese Canadians. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of always curious to see where it's similar and where it's yeah. different because that question of how to, how do you be one thing while not giving up being a second? Right, and that's why I think the <laughs> biggest, there's a difference between I feel Chinese yeah, Americans yeah. and Chinese Canadians is mm. that, and it's not just Chinese Americans, Canadian, Canadians. I think it's like ethnic uh, Americans and ethnic uh, like uh, immigrant yeah, uh, yeah. Canadians. Is that a lot of Canadians who are like Indian, Chinese, or whatever, they still are connected to their roots more. I find mm -hmm. than like America because once you're American, it's like a melting pot, right? Yeah. They're like more American than they feel yeah. Chinese uh, from my uh, mm -hmm. uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Canada, we're still very like, oh no, we still feel more uh, like equal, like Canadian yeah. and Chinese or mm. Canadian and Indian or Canadian and Polish or something. It, yeah, it's it's more of like a dual. Exactly. Like, dual identity. Yeah, exactly, thing. exactly. So the, um, so when you were younger, like did that cause problems for you? Like you didn't know like how much should I assimilate with the other Canadians? How much should I only hang out with the Chinese people? So <laughs> yeah, it, there was uh, like sometimes, um, like when I meet other Canadian, uh, Chinese Canadians, sometimes I'll be like, uh, like they, they're when, when some of them are not very connected to like being Chinese and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I felt a little uh, mm -hmm. weird about that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, but you're Chinese, shouldn't yeah. you uh, know how to like not not speak the language, but at least understand the culture more or be proud to be Chinese, kind mm -hmm. of in a way. Um, and they just were not very uh, like mm -hmm. they didn't really care in mm -hmm. a way about the culture aspect, which I found maybe it was something that my parents really instilled mm -hmm. into my sister and I. Um, because my dad was very into Chinese uh, history, culture, mm -hmm. and then my mom was um, also, in yeah, a way, yeah. very proud to be Chinese. Because no matter what, they're like, you need to know how to speak your yeah, language. Yeah. And they would use, like, the example, like, even, like, Jewish people, they would yeah, know yeah. how to yeah. speak <laughs> Hebrew. Uh, like, my Hebrew is not as good, but it's just, yeah. Like, they, they would be, they, they would know be the good. culture. They're but, I, yeah, the culture, and I, and I feel, it's, it's ironic, I'm on the opposite side of that, <laughs> where, like, I've always wanted to learn Hebrew better. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, in high school, I even took, like, a little Hebrew class outside of school mm -hmm. at, like, a local college or whatever. It's always been on my goal. And then when I, even after I moved to China, and I learned Chinese, it's still in the back of my head, like, well, if I learn Chinese, I can definitely learn Hebrew. Right, There's right. an alphabet. You know, yeah. this is not not going to be as difficult, and yet it hasn't happened. So it's, you just need something mm -hmm. to like. There has yeah. to be something where you can like spend because you, yeah, yeah. you need time to be able to like sit and like. Yeah, you need you know, time, learn. but also there needs to be reason, and exactly. I think that's part of the biggest challenge. When I like those parents are like, oh, like get my my son hyped about learning Chinese, right. and I'm like, well, to some degree, you need to you need to show them why it's going to be, benefit? yeah, what's the benefit? benefit? Exactly. Like why, if you, you think it's important that the second generation children speak the language, exactly. Yeah. but why? Because if you can't, I mean, if you can't, if, you, if, if you parents can't cannot that. tell the kids, then why should the kids, you know, yeah, why should the kids care? Care, exactly. And so it's like a lot of times, like the parents, I think really feel strongly about it, but they just haven't thought through, right. 
So like, but you, for you, it sounds like, you know, the, you know, history, I was very fortunate. Exactly. My food, dad, you know, he was, he, my dad was like, Hey, in the future, this, I remember the conversation when I was a kid, he was like, you need to, cause we didn't, my sister and I were like not wanting to learn, uh, try, and also cause mm -hmm. the, the method of teaching us back, back then was yeah, like, yeah. Hey, you got to memorize, like my dad, yeah. would, you gotta it's, memorize not much, this. it's not much better. It's still grindy to learn. Yeah, very, exactly. It's very grindy. And then yeah. my dad would be like, Hey, you know, like we're crying. He's like, Nope, you gotta learn it. And it's just very like, not a pleasant experience. Of course that's the only way he knew. So I can't mm -hmm. fault him for that. And I, and if he, yeah. if he didn't do that, then I wouldn't be able to speak yeah. it now. Right. And obviously I still have a lot of um, work to do in, mm -hmm. in both Mandarin and Cantonese. He taught me Cantonese cause he was like, I'm going to teach you Cantonese, but I don't want you to learn my uh, Guangdong. Oh, yeah. oh, right? really? So that's what, and then my mom <laughs> speaks good Mandarin, like fluent, but yeah. she also didn't want to teach us something wrong. Mm -hmm. That's why they pushed us into uh, a school. Mandarin school. And so uh, my dad, the one thing he said that, Hey, China one day is going to be strong. Mm -hmm. You need to know the language. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and that was always in the back of my head. And um, so that's why I was like, okay, I guess that's like one of the motivation. Okay. China, whatever that meant, China being strong. I don't know what that meant culturally, yeah, yeah. economically, politically. I'm not sure. But it was enough for you as a kid. You're like, Oh, this is, this is bigger than me and my family. Exactly. You know, exactly. Like, it, it's a thing like, we need to, I need to know this for bigger reasons right. than just like being able to go to the store, which I can do in English. Exactly. And you mm. had to trust, like as a kid, you had to kind of trust that your parents would be the ones yeah. who guide you in a way. And mm. luckily, uh, it, that That's helped. interesting. So maybe what we've learned is, and I don't have any kids, and I assume you don't have no, any kids. No, I don't have any kids either. Is, uh, as a parent, giving parenting advice as people that don't have children, either give your kids very specific reasons that they will <laughs> use language, or incredibly vague geopolitical ones. Either one of <laughs> Either them one? Yeah, might yeah. work. Um, yeah, yeah. Throw it against the wall. Because the thing is, if it wasn't for him doing that, I wouldn't be able to e even book the role that I have right now. Mm. Because I didn't, I, I wasn't, I didn't study acting, didn't do, do any acting for like uh, mm -hmm. my whole life. It was just mm -hmm. maybe the past uh, three years, uh, four mm -hmm. years. I just like, I just want to explore Toronto. I really mm -hmm. like, I love Toronto City. I was born mm -hmm. and raised there. I love the people in it. And I'm like, I like to explore different areas that maybe I've never seen before. And mm -hmm. through acting, I was like, oh, this is the film studio. I didn't know that. I walked by yeah, here all the time. Different places. Exactly. I just want to explore the city more. And through, uh, through, because being able to speak the language, I was able to book some roles. One was a student film uh, where I had to speak Cantonese. Mm. And in this short film, I had to speak Mandarin. Wow. So uh, even though it's just like a couple lines, but, but, just but that gives you to, a big advantage exactly. to actually be able to speak it. And if I didn't have that, maybe I wouldn't have booked it and I wouldn't be in LA right now. Nice. You know, LA. what's really funny is like, I kind of took a look back at my life and I was like, you know, I didn't plan it to be this way, but in LA, I'm basically part of the Chinese immigrant yeah. community. Right. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. like all the people I know are like Chinese immigrants. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If I, cause I, I had this realization, it's like, if I didn't meet you in high school or college, I don't know any Americans that didn't live in China because mm -hmm. like everybody lived in China. Even today after the shoot, I have a friend of mine who lived in Beijing for many, many years. He's coming over. We're eating, we're eating lunch. Right. And like, I didn't know that uh, like, these are the people I know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, and that's the thing too, like even mm -hmm. in high school, because when I was, mm -hmm. I realized like my high school was very diverse. Mm -hmm. And at the time you just think we're all just like, yeah, just, we don't ask about the background or anything. Yeah. And it wasn't until I went to university and started traveling. I'm like, Man, I think back, there's a lot of diverse, like my classmates are very diverse. It would be so interesting to know their background, their yeah. story. How now. did it all happen? How did it all happen? How did it get there? How did we all end up in the same place? Yeah. Like, like, uh, like there's something. I think that generation, that, uh, that first immigrant uh, generation, oftentimes those stories never get told. Yeah. You know, because it's like they, they come over and like, you know, and it's a different thing. But I did the same thing going over to China and spending a decade mm -hmm. there. And it's like, oh, if I wasn't like a comedian, right. no one's asking about right, your right, story. It's right. like, you know, you're like, oh, you, they're, oh, you're an English teacher, right? It's like, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. But like, everybody would just assume this very basic, simplistic idea about why you're there. Mm -hmm. And like, as an American that lived overseas, every single Westerner that came to China had some sort of very interesting right, story. Right, exactly, yeah. And it's actually the same way over here, except that a lot of times those immigrants, be, I think mostly because of the English level, yeah. not being there, yeah. just like you need a translator to get into that story. Exactly. And so there's, um, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit with the film. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, so we're gonna be drinking this. This is a uh, show puar. Show puar, okay. So the show puar is cooked puar. If you have like dim sum, uh, restaurants, a lot of them like to have yeah, this, this one, yeah. except that this will be a lot um, richer because one, the tea quality is better. This is my friend Dwayne's 2010 Reserve, so it's okay. aged 
20, 10, 14 years now. Oh, so you can also age it kind of like wine. Yep, it ages like wine. They pack them into cakes like this over here, and then you can age them in the cakes or you can age them loose. Is there a scent as well? Um, this one will be a little musty, uh, yep. darker, but it's not. It's, like it's earthy. Uh, yeah, it's not earthy. Very, yeah. The flavor is going to be very earthy. Um, the other thing is that when you have dim sum, usually they are re-steeping those leaves so many times yeah. that it's like weaker. But I actually like that with the dim sum because you have food. You don't need a rich, right, yeah. you know, big tea to go with your food. But drinking tea by itself, we'll see what you think about this, okay. uh, this one right here. Cool. Um, so as we're preparing this tea, um, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the film that you're in and uh, why, it was, why it was important for you to act in this film. So... This is one of the first short films that I did, and we filmed it two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically, uh, yeah, it was important to me because it was like the first group, the story is, is the Qing Dynasty sent a group of Chinese students to America, to Hartford. Mm -hmm. what you? There you go. Yeah, yeah smells like, like, smells like the dim sum yeah, restaurant. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, to Hartford, Connecticut, in mm -hmm. order to educate a select group of Chinese students to learn like American science, technology, things. And it's based mm -hmm. on a true story. Um, thank you. And then, um, yeah, and then basically the students, you know, they got used to American uh, way of life in a so way. So what, what kind of year would this be? This would be like 1880s. Okay. Like 1880s. So a group of Chinese that went over to America in the 1880s. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, and, and what is the story around? It's around their life and experience, experience in America? And then uh, eventually the lead, which is me, kind of mm -hmm. like... Um, uh, kind of like rebels against like a Qing official coming to mm -hmm. like test what he's learned mm -hmm. and uh, yeah just like the lead it's just like a yeah. almost like a, like a intertwined, intertwined with like a story of like a kid growing up in a yeah. way um, so there's like a younger version of my character and then there's my character and it's like a 15 16 minute long short film mm -hmm. And the director managed to actually get like really legit costumes, like That's great. Qing Dynasty the stuff, some scrolls. Stuff. Yeah, I did an episode. I don't know if it's aired by the time this comes out, but I had a traditional Beijing um, storytelling like Ping Shu performer mm -hmm. come over. And so he had his traditional robe with him. And I was like, I have a traditional robe as a, a Xiangsheng performer. Yeah. So we did the whole episode in the robes, yeah. and it, uh, I, I just love that. It's very comfortable. It's yeah, like, yeah. I actually like that. Because it's airy, too. There's like a lot it's of airy room. It's and, um, airy, and there's a pocket in there, yeah, like, exactly. you know, which is like, you know, now I assume it's a cell phone pocket, but you, <laughs> you always got to have a pocket. Yeah. So, yeah. So what, did you, uh, what was the most interesting thing about, you know, inhabiting a, a, a Qing Dynasty uh, Chinese like person Chinese. coming over? Um, so my character is almost, so I had like the Q. Mm, yep. But I was dressed in Western clothing. Okay. Uh, so I was like in like the three piece kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it was cool because it's almost like if I was born in Canada or the U.S. North America a mm -hmm. hundred years ago, mm -hmm. this would be maybe be like you. me. Yeah. yeah. So it was just like like cool to be in like in that time period how I would be like um, back then, mm -hmm. and then probably having to straddle two vastly different cultures mm. um, and the expectation and pressures that I don't have yeah. as a you know Canadian Chinese in current day right but back then it was much more stark I mean this group of people there there were a group of scholars that went over in the 1800s yeah. as the Qing dynasty was kind of reforming itself and questions like will it survive to the modern day right. how is it going to happen right. uh, by the way cheers she enjoyed the tea cheers thank you uh, let me know what you think of this mm. Very nice, very like very earthy. Mm -hmm. I feel like this one's a bit stronger than the the previous one. Yeah, this one is darker, earthier, woodier, um, and uh, yeah, very similar to what I have yeah. uh, in dim sum, but like but more, sharp, yeah, yeah, much more punch to it. So it's like if this this t by the twentieth steep will taste pretty similar to Rob, what you have in the yeah, thing. Yeah. So like in the restaurant, they keep steeping, steeping, yeah, steeping. Yeah. Um, again, I actually think that it's better a little weaker if you're eating it with food. Because then you don't it, want the strong tea taste. Yeah, it's maybe. like it's too much. But this is this is definitely a tea where you make this sort of tea at home and you're like, I'm having tea now. Yeah, it's yeah, not exactly. like uh, not like oh, a little sweetness right. and like blah blah. It's like it's you're having tea. You're setting it. everything up. It's like mm -hmm. a whole experience. It's a thing. So. Yeah. But yeah, so the um, that era of uh, Qing Dynasty scholars coming over to the states, I have a lot of uh, connection with as well because the. Uh, one of those people was uh, Lao She. Mm. So Lao She was a um, was a uh, an author and an intellectual and a playwright 
who uh, was in, uh, he studied in England. Mm -hmm. He came back to China and he founded the Laoshe Tea House, oh, okay. which is um, uh, which is the most famous place to perform traditional Chinese comedy. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like at the tea house there to be able to have the the people that went abroad and came back did very interesting things. I know Tsinghua University was mm -hmm. founded by another Chinese from the Qing Dynasty who had studied abroad. Mm -hmm. So these people. Um, it was, you know, coming back into China and explaining what they saw right. and the things that they did, which were radically different, mm -hmm. starting a Western style university, right. yeah. you know, like these sorts of things um, were as a result of what they saw on this, on these trips. Yeah. Yeah. And so what was, uh, what, what did they see when they came to Connecticut in the 1880s? Like, right, what was exactly. their experience like? So in our, um, in our short film, um, one of the, the lead, the younger version was learning how to play baseball. Oh, that's fun. So that was cool, like that cultural exchange. I liked how um, yeah. the director who also wrote the, mm -hmm. um, the, the script, mm. uh, his name is Eric Chen. Uh, he, I like that he incorporate, incorporated that. Yeah. Um, and then other things like he incorporated was like, you know, like the, kind of like the um, mm -hmm. racism element, yeah. like, like grabbing the, like the, like the white grabbing kid grabbing cue, the cue yeah. and yeah. like, what, oh, you look like a girl, things like yeah. that. So, cue, by the way, people don't know is the, the, right. the braided hair from the Qing dynasty. Exactly. Long braided hair. Yeah. Um, so, so it was kind of a, a mix of all those experiences together. Yeah. And then, um, and then again, tell me about your character and, and where they were in the story. So my character was basically, um, so I start off in the film just like learning studying um like american things oh mm -hmm. so my character also had a mentor mm. based on a real character named young wing mm -hmm. who actually was i think one of the first graduates uh in, oh, wow. uh, in the u.s like mm. a chinese uh, american and he's the one who kind of like guides me through the whole uh, living in america um and eventually me kind of like uh, rebelling mm -hmm. or, the, or the character rebelling uh, against the examination officials mm -hmm. um, yeah so look at how dark that is yeah that's very dark the uh, yeah this gets pretty intense so if it's darker is, is it kind of like heady as well you know the concept of oh like yeah um, it's actually a good question um, I want to say this is cooling, but I actually am not 100% mm -hmm. sure. Uh, I know that the, um, the, yeah, there's a lot of Chinese medicine involved in terms right, of exactly. what the tea does and doesn't do to your body, but I'm not as advanced in, in knowing that. True. Actually, people <laughs> ask me a lot of times, like, oh, what does this do? What does that do? And because I'm not a TCM doctor, right, I'm right. like, I, I, kinda, I don't get into right. that as much. But cheers. Cheers, cheers. One. I will say that this is, um, you know, not FDA approved medical advice, <laughs> but I feel like this tea and many people I know, uh, know that the cook pour is good for your stomach. It mm. helps the digestion. Right. If you've had a lot of spicy food or a lot of uh, fatty food, yeah. uh, like this is one of the reasons why it's served with dim sum, yeah, you're, you yeah. know, fried stuff, whatever, the oily, blah, blah, the yeah. oily stuff. This, um, you know, the jenny, like it, um, it helps with the uh, digestion of the fatty yeah. foods and the, the oil and the heat. Because I know um, green tea is more cooling. From... Yeah, yeah. And so, be interesting. I'll actually, I should ask, ask get some expertise on that. True. Um, but yeah, so um, so being in this film, uh, to be able to go back into that time period, did you feel like a, a kinship with this character from 100 years ago where like you had to go through learning how to be, you know, in both places yeah, and the character's I, also going through the same exactly thing? Exactly, like... Um... Yeah, like the the like being able to still how do you retain your roots while still trying to assimilate to like the new culture mm -hmm. is very kind of like similar to how when I was still navigating what does it mean with my identity as a Chinese Canadian mm -hmm. uh, growing up. Um, so yeah, it was there was I felt like I could, was able to pull into real life experience in order to play the character mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, and I always feel a kinship everywhere I go when mm -hmm. I when I travel. I always try to find like a Chinese restaurant. Mm. And I always try to find some um, something that's culturally Chinese in order to feel what it was like back then. Mm. Um, like even if I was to, like when I go to Europe, especially mm -hmm. uh, when I went to London or when I went to the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I bring my girlfriend around. She mm -hmm. she didn't. She was always fascinated that I would always want to try a Chinese food, a Chinese mm -hmm. restaurant, and I always want to talk to the people because that's where I feel the kinship. Yeah. Just to, just to ask them, hey, where are you from? And then let yeah. them know, because maybe they've all like, maybe they're all Wenzhou people, yeah, maybe yeah, all yeah. Fujian people. Then I'm like, I'm, 
啊啊，我是中国啊，我是啊加拿大华人 ，right？、Mm. But I'm, I'm also Cantonese. So then let、yeah. them see. Maybe they haven't seen a Cantonese person yeah, before,、exactly. right? So I feel a kinship there as well. So yeah, whether it's playing a character、mm-hmm. or、uh, traveling, I always try to find something culture culturally Chinese. Or when I'm in Zurich,、mm-hmm. I went to a Chinese restaurant,、mm. and actually my girlfriend wanted to eat Chinese food because、mm-hmm. she she's got so used to the variety of like. Like dishes,、mm-hmm. especially there's a lot of like Thai, right? Like yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, gai lan, uh,、um, yeah, yeah. Chinese broccoli and all that stuff.、Yeah. That she is begging me when she comes to Toronto to eat yeah, Chinese. Yeah, she's、food. like, oh, I mean, and there's、like、good it, Chinese food and it's good Chinese food as well. Yeah. What's、uh, Chinese food like in Zurich? <laughs> so <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. So again, the Chinese food in Europe, minus I feel like minus、uh, the UK, is mostly、mm. like not like non Cantonese food.、Um, Man, but Switzerland、yeah. is so expensive, though. So、oh, yeah, it's expensive. It's so expensive. That's the other thing. Even here in a, in America, like you know, there's really good Chinese food in San Gabriel Valley and Irvine. But part of my head is still stuck because I lived in China for ten、right. years. I'm like, I know how much this should cost. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, you're paying for their rent and blah blah blah. It's like you know, the, there's reasons. It's、yeah. not like you're being extorted,、exactly. but it's like. Oh, this doesn't have to be so expensive. Yeah, it's so expensive. So it's actually not. So the restaurant I went to was actually not bad. So how I usually just you know check、mm-hmm. the reviews, look at the pictures, and then that's how I decide. And usually I get it pretty accurate.、Mm. Uh, and it was actually not bad. Like the food that they had was actually pretty good.、Mm-hmm. Um, like if I had to live in Zurich, I'd be like, okay, I'll be able to survive、okay. going to this restaurant and stuff. But they're not that. Of course, they're not that.、Many. Is it kind of like in America we have like American Chinese food? Do、uh, they have like European Chinese food? No, I think it's still very、uh, Chinese Chinese. Okay. But I have to say, in in Italy, you know、mm. how like when you go to like eat Italian food,、mm. it's like good quality. It's like small portions. Yeah,、right? yeah. Like pasta is like made like yeah, yeah. with a lot of like、uh, labor、yeah. and but then it's like small portions. They do. I feel like they do the same thing with Chinese food. Oh, that's interesting. But I'm like, I'm like, I'm used to this big plate. Of yeah. Stuff, so、yeah. it's like the, the the food that you get like in in Toronto or、yeah. Vancouver, where it's like a big takeout, you know, portion. Yeah. They take that. They make it like they shrink it to like to fit like the nice plates, and then they charge you like twice as much. Twice as much. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm like, that's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Like when I went, that was kind of my experience when I went to Japan. They would serve me like very reasonable portions of food, and I'd get upset.、Mm. I was like. This is totally reasonable, and I I lived in China and America, two places where they give you too much food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, now I'm seeing like a reasonable person should eat this and be happy, and I'm not happy. <laughs> But the thing is, in Italy, I feel like the Chinese food is unreasonable. Like it's yeah, still yeah. unreasonable. How could you like a basic fried rice that you can cook in like a few minutes, and then they make it like just like in this bowl, and then they charge you the the same amount as like、yeah. pa- like. I, always, I have a thing、or? against like I have a thing against fancy bowls. I'm right, like yeah, if you、yeah. if you've picked the bowl for the food. You've thought about this too much, right? Right. Like, and and I'm I'm not gonna get that extra value. I'm、yeah. I'm such a cheapo.、Guy. I'm like I'm always looking for that. I'm looking for the value、I'm、as well. The value. So that's when people ask me、uh, about like, is this food good? I'm like, okay, wait. We have to explain like, like what is good. And what is good? What like you had the a price? Philosophical. Exactly.、Like. Is it the price point? Like I, like I could eat like chain pizza. Because、yeah. depending on the price, if it's on on sale, like、yeah. if it's like it's like half off or something, then、mm-hmm. then that's how I start like comparing, right?、Mm-hmm. Like obviously New York style pizza in New York,、yeah. or、uh, Domino's. If Domino's is like fifty or seventy percent off, I'm gonna eat the、yeah. Domino's more often than eat、yeah. New York style pizza.、Exactly. But New York style pizza is still like the best to、mm-hmm. me, you know.、Uh, so so as somebody who has experience getting Chinese food all over the world, yeah, what do you look for to be able to tell whether a Chinese restaurant is legit? Ooh, that's a very, very, very good question.、Uh, I think the pictures. I have to、mm. look at the pictures.、Uh, I look at because sometimes it's hard to judge from like the outside now. Yeah, yeah. Because、um, sometimes, like you know how they say, it has to, to be a rundown place、yeah. for it to be good. That might not be the case. Yeah, you might get food poisoning. Or especially in 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 LA, there's a lot of prosperous Chinese here. They have good restaurants. Like、yeah. it's like it's not like oh, it has to have been started by an immigrant in the '80s or else it's not good yeah, anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah. like. But like so, okay. So pictures. What do you look for in the pictures? Pictures. I look at how it like uh, uh, the, kind of like the quality, how the the color looks,、mm-hmm. um, how the amount of oil that you can see, like yeah, on the you plate. You don't want huge. You don't want huge of amount of oils. What they serve as well.、Um, but yeah, it's just it's almost like you have to get a feel for it to to really know. And、yeah. that's why because、uh, sometimes like for example, if you look at like Shaolongbao, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes I look at a picture and. Like、not just me. A lot yeah, of people、yeah. can tell if it's like good or not. If it's、yeah. like very doughy and stuff. Yeah. 
Um, you want the shell on ball, the, the really thin. Thin, yeah. thin enough, but not too thin that it breaks. Yeah. Um, so like my girlfriend will send it to me and uh, she'll, uh, and I'll look and I'll be like, okay, it, this one seems good. But again, yeah. sometimes I could be wrong as yeah. well. You can't, you can't ever be perfect, perfect about this. Yeah. A lot of people ask me similar things about tea. They're like, oh, is this tea good? And they show me a picture. I'm like, I mean, ultimately you really have to try you it. You have to try it, yeah. You know, I can give you some basic ideas. Like if it's ground up into a powder, I can be like, it's probably not going to be good. Right, right. If it's in a tea bag, it's like, it's not to say you can't get good tea in a tea bag, yeah. but the fact it's in a tea bag means they made it for the Western right, right. Uh, uh, drinkers. And the fact that they knew they were doing that means there's an unbelievable desire to cheat yeah. and give bad tea because no one will ever yeah. know. Yeah, so you already, you, you already know like that's like the first test. Yeah. And it might not be 100% accurate, yeah. but that's like the first even, test. Even the best, like the fanciest brand in a supermarket ultimately knows they're selling to the type of people who get their tea from right, a supermarket. Right, exactly. So it's like, it's very different from like a place like mine, which I suppose would be a specialty store. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's like, all I do is tea. And it's not even that like tea tea. It's yeah. like Camellia sinensis, Liu Da Cha Lei, like mm -hmm. the main six types of tea. Um, and, you know, I have, I have from like, you know, China, Taiwan, but it's all the, the sort of Chinese tea tradition. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I mean, even potentially if I were to do you know, other types of tea, like I'm, I'm also would be learning in mm -hmm. that, in that case. But, um, but yeah, if somebody sends me just a picture of the tea, I'm oftentimes not able to exactly. do Exactly. So I just tell, okay, I feel like this is the right one. So usually mm -hmm. it's just pictures, mm -hmm. pictures. Uh, if it's a place I don't know, uh, I just look at the pictures and then you look are at there how any, many people. Are there any dishes that you're like, if they serve that, that's uh, a good sign. Ah, uh, okay. That's, um, dishes. Uh, cause usually I'll get like, uh, uh, Gailan, uh, yeah, Jialan, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jialan. Yeah. and then I'll look at like the meat dish. Mm -hmm. um, I think even even though this is very Cana uh, a North American Chinese dish, uh, gulu yok, you know, mm, yeah. uh, sweet and sour pork. Yeah, yeah. Um, if they cook it well, then I'm like, okay, then this is that's good. That's good. Yeah, it's a good sign. Um, and then also like chong bao nyo mm -hmm. If they cook it well, if there's enough like yeah, amount yeah. of beef. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, and then that's, that's, a, that's, good that's a good sign. Yeah. For me, it's like, there's a restaurant here that does uh, sheng jian bao, oh, like the, okay, like yeah. the pan fried bao. And like, that is such a unique dish in the States. It's just starting yeah. to get to the place you can find it. At this point, if I see a restaurant that has that, I'm like, I trust all the other food. Right, now. okay. Because you need this like very specialized giant cast iron mm -hmm. in order to make them. And it's, uh, it's not a dish that, like Westerners know about and are asking true, for. True. So it's like, if they're making that, it's because they believe the local Chinese community yeah. wants it. I actually should rephrase yeah. that because um, that's probably for Cantonese cuisine. Like for mm -hmm. me, like to yeah, judge yeah. Cantonese cuisine. And then if I was to judge like other parts, it would be like, yeah, just trying the Xiaolong Bao. Yeah, yeah. Or like if, if I'm trying like a dim sum place, it's trying yeah, yeah. their uh, Luo Bu Gao. Yeah, yeah. And trying their Xia Jiao. Yeah, yeah, the Xia Jiao and then if always, it's, yeah. If you have bad Xia Jiao, it's like, that's a bad sign. Yeah, and you usually. You know people are gonna order that. Exactly. <laughs> so. And usually I will never get Xiaolong Bao at a dim, like a Cantonese dim sum place. It's usually not good. It's usually mm. like thick or, or, you know, I would have to get it yeah. from like a, a Shanghai Dian Xin yeah, restaurant. Yeah, exactly. You know? So like a lot of this is like, um, I think partially to survive, like a lot of these restaurants are like, well, we have to do all the Chinese cuisine. Right, right, right. And it's kind of, it's, uh, I think it's one of the things actually now that I've started doing cultural food stuff, I never expected to be a you know, food, food vlogger. And, food vlogger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and even to some degree now, like I guess it is technically what I do, but I don't think of myself that way. But the, um, but like one thing that I recognize weirdly enough is the, what people are missing now is not the breadth because there's so many options. Exactly. They're missing the depth. Exactly. They're saying, okay, great, you have green tea, but do you have like six types of green yes, tea yeah. from different mountains, from different yeah. things? And like, I do. Uh, and, and why the number, or like, for instance, we have four spring green teas that are being sold right now, mm -hmm. but we don't have 12 and we don't have one. Yeah. You just you do know? the Ford really, really well. Yeah. Like it's like, sure you know, you... four for me was like, I know the farmers, I can actually get it directly from them. 12 is like, I don't know 12 green tea farmers. Right. Like, you know, for me, the number four made sense because it was what I was able to do. And it's, um, somewhat reasonable. Also, I feel like we also have too much choice mm -hmm. in, in our days many exactly, times. Like yeah. if my job is helping people pick the good teas, then I need to not select 18 yeah, different Because I trust that the ones that you picked are gonna be the ones that That's I'm the gonna hope. Like, yeah. yeah, the hope is like, I've trying to done that for you. So sometimes people are like, do you have recommendations for stuff that is not on your shop? 
And I'm like, on one hand, I understand this idea. It's like, oh, there's, and there are, there are great teas yeah. that are not in my shop. I'm not yeah. saying I have the only good teas <laughs> in the world. But it's like, I don't have recommendations because I didn't, I don't know the farmers. I didn't yeah. go there. I didn't do their whole supply chain yeah, check. Exactly, yeah. I don't know how it was shipped, how it was sealed, how it was packaged. Right. Like these are, it sounds wacko, yeah. but that's what, that's the uh, standard I had for myself when I lived in China. Yeah. If I just get like some random, like I didn't, I know I wouldn't go on Taobao mm -hmm. as a tea drinker in China mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. buy tea off of Taobao. Yeah. And I would go to the tea market and I would know exactly. the people who yeah. are making it, or at least the guy who owns the shop that knows the farmers. Yeah. And um, it's obviously very difficult to do that in the West, yeah. which is part of the reason why you guys have come to me. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, um, but it's like, just because it's difficult to do in the West doesn't mean it's not the right way to do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. And so a lot of the times with food and culture and even with arts and entertainment, it kind of goes along with that. But you're right. Yeah, like now people are trying to uh, get like the more authentic yeah. uh, experience instead of, you know, trying to get everything. Yeah, you know, and so with the more authentic time. experience, sometimes people are like, oh, do I have to do the whole tea table thing? It's like, no, but... I would be wrong to not advise you to do it. Right. Yeah. Because like, yeah, you can drink it in a mug. And I have a video about my very basic technique. I say, if you have nothing else to make tea, two mugs, leaves in one mug, steep in there, pour the liquid into another, drink from here while you keep the mm -hmm, leaves mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. Now you can re-steep in there. Right. If you have two mugs, you can make tea pretty well, even without a pot. It'll be messy, you'll spill a little, but it doesn't matter. Um, but like, even but like I can't tell you like you're gonna get the best experience off of it. You just throw it in a mug right, and you yeah. leave it there for, like, it'll be good. It'll still be better than what you have, but there are, in order to access authenticity, you need to learn. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, and so it's like, um, and so I think that people are getting a little bit braver now mm -hmm. out in the market of saying, we will make you authentic Chinese food, yeah. but it's gonna taste a little different yeah, than yeah. you expect. And that's, I feel like that's what happened in Toronto mm -hmm. because for a long, for a long time, uh, I remember as a kid finding like a proper Chinese restaurant. Not not that it was difficult. It's just that you always have to like uh, know through word of mouth which restaurant's good. Yeah. But then the past, 20, but it's not just uh, Chinese restaurant. I felt like a lot of different uh, ethnic cuisine, Thai food, mm -hmm. Vietnamese food, Indian food over yeah. the past Indian food, over the past 15 years, it started, I think as more people in Toronto, Canada, Vancouver, they all start traveling and they start coming back. Mm -hmm. Uh, they want the more authentic food, and then the chefs actually knew how to make the food. Mm -hmm. It's just that the palate for the uh, local residents weren't yeah. ready for it. So now yeah. Toronto has really good Thai food, really good Indian, Cantonese. Yeah. And now before it used to be a lot of Cantonese restaurants, now you have like uh, Chuan Thai, yeah. a lot of different regions of China, Guo uh, Chao, uh, Mi Xian, Yunnan coming to Toronto that yeah. didn't really exist when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, and then like Indian uh, restaurants, um, and even New York style pizza yeah. has been coming to Toronto, so now I don't have to like fly That's to New cool. York to get yeah. it. So it's just so many like a wide range and yeah. very very good uh, yeah. cuisines. And and the cool thing about it is, I think like this is in my mind what good cultural exchange looks like. It's not that the chefs got better; mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's that the people who are not in the community were more open minded. Exactly, exactly. It's like once you have people like if if whatever the Chinese chef is like, this is what I would make for my family at home, but yeah. I don't think you will like it. And then I think there is a step that needs to be taken by the chef to at least put it on the menu. Yeah. Because otherwise people don't know. They can't they can't ask and be proactive about like, what do you have that I don't right, know about? Right, it's right. really hard question to answer. But at the same time, like the main thing is people just don't feel like it'll be real. Like yeah, I know yeah. so many people in the West that they try to do they really love Chinese tea. And then they're like, but Americans don't drink it. Right. So I need to make peach oolong. Yeah. And they wouldn't drink peach oolong themselves, but they think that the other people will. And so they make peach oolong and there's a bajillion peach oolongs and there's nothing wrong with peach oolong, but like the reason why they're doing the thing is kind of getting diluted. Yeah. And then the result of it is when people like the peach oolong, they say, well, what's next? And then they don't have what's next because they already gave up on what they liked in order to get more attention mm -hmm. and, and be more accessible. And so my take on this has been the tea is going to be exactly the tea that I want to drink. Yeah. But, my, and, and the equipment even, I use the traditional equipment, but the methodology of how I share this, I can make this very accessible. Mm -hmm. We can do a podcast. Like we can do stuff that um, it makes it easy in the media. Yeah. I shoot short videos. Like I'm not asking people to say you have to meditate 30 minutes to drink tea. <laughs> but people do that though yeah, in the yeah. West is they're like, you have to be incredibly mindful in order to drink tea. And I think tea is mindful, but 
I'm not helping this thing by saying like either you meditate half an hour when you drink the tea or else you can't drink it. I feel like once they discover something, they go a little too far with it. Yeah, and yeah, they make it the whole personality when it's like, hey, it's just it's It's just normal. Like yeah, or it can be, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. And and a lot of that comes from being willing to say, what culturally am I willing to change to fit into the new place? Would you have to change something? And what culturally do I refuse to change? Because right. the moment I change it, I'm not really doing what I yeah, came here exactly, for. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Do you feel like, um, going a little bit back to acting, right. Do you? what did it mean to you to have a, a, a Chinese director for a movie like this? Like, do you feel like this is, uh, it's like, it, this story never even would have been written no, without that wouldn't, director? It wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been written. Um, I think if it wasn't for him, it's because it's, it's like, it might be maybe he might have a totally different idea, but for him, he was able to find this story, like mm-hmm. a, an American Chinese story. So it was very, 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 very specific. Mm-hmm. So yeah, without him, this I don't think this short film would have been made at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was very fortunate and very hoping mm-hmm. that I was able to book uh, yeah. uh, this role. Because I, I at the time, I was unrepresented. Yeah, I was still trying to build up my demo, my mm-hmm. credit and everything. And that was the first year I was um, acting. And I was just online looking for like casting calls. Oh, nice! And so you really you dug it up. You I dug were, it up. Like you I were found from it the, from exactly, the and then I found it on uh, on the website. I sent him. Uh, I, I submitted it, and then yeah, he got back to me. And then after like a month, then we were already starting to shoot. Wow. So I was very fortunate because I'm like this story. I I've watched TV series that are like this, mm. like maybe made in China, and for that to be filmed in Canada, I was like, it was very strange. So that's why everything was just, mm-hmm. I had to really vet it to make sure it's like, like this is too good. Like, yeah, yeah, I was like, why, why is this Chinese guy making a very specific story and uh, going to location scouting and like doing all these like proper kind of production work? Yeah, yeah. I was like, this is suspicious. Yeah, I was looking yeah. it up, Googling him, Googling everything. And I'm, okay. Hey, there's no red flags and it all then checks out. All checks out. So then I was like, okay. So, so cool. when you then for some, so you're like really kind of just getting into acting in many yeah. ways. Yeah. What What has it been like as somebody kind of I guess during the internet age, you can look up casting calls. Like, what have you done to try to go from zero to one here of now being in a, a couple films and being able to fly out to LA and meet people? Um, I did a lot of research. Um, so basically, I always like uh, looking things up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so my, I, the idea I had was like, if I do acting, um, the, well, the one advice that I read online is it's show business, mm-hmm. especially for film and TV. So I was thinking if I'm not a great actor or something, at least I have to put all my skill points mm-hmm. to yeah. the business <laughs> side. Uh, so that maybe through there, once I get in, then, you know, I get booked, I mm-hmm. get paid and I can reinvest that into taking more acting classes to get better. Mm-hmm. Um, because I always thought like maybe acting was just like natural mm-hmm. talent, but mm-hmm. yes, there is. But you also have to like train. There's control over the yeah, exactly. your, your body is, is the instrument, and you need to find control over yeah, exactly. what, what it does. So through that, through uh, um, through acting, I was able to like explore a lot about myself as well. Mm-hmm. And the one thing was I want to really kind of uh, present Chinese culture in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, just yeah, like doing like this short film. I wanted to be part of that kind of like. Uh, movement, I guess, yeah, in a way, yeah. yeah for so I think that the um, uh, you know, this is something a lot of people forget in show business is the other part of a lot of times people say the business and they're like, oh, that's a bad thing. Mm. But in many ways, I actually find it um, uh, very liberating. Yes, because it's like there may be somebody who's just this amazing acting genius, and yeah. you're never gonna like if you get there, it's gonna be twenty years, and it's like it's really hard. Yeah. But one, there's not as many of those people as you think. Yeah, um, and exactly. two, even if there are those people, there are many opportunities. And three, um, you know, the good thing about it being a business, like any other business, if you're good to your clients and they're good to yeah. you, you can work together again. Yeah. And so like you want, you don't need to know 80 directors. Yeah, exactly. You can have a good working relationship with a couple directors and all of a sudden you find out like, oh, you kind of got more work than exactly, you, than exactly, you need. Exactly, yeah. You know, so it's not like, oh, I need to know every major celebrity I've ever known or else I can't make it in acting or creative yeah, work. Yeah. Um, I also just think acting in general is very useful for other things in life. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, it does, definitely helps like yeah. not having nerves, just like being yeah. calm, just like being able to get on stage and just like, yeah, yeah. you present. It's not, your first podcast, you're not freaking out. Yeah, I'm not freaking out. <laughs> and if I think I, if I wasn't like doing acting, well, first of all, if I wasn't yeah. doing acting, I wouldn't even be here. Uh, but if I um, wasn't doing acting, yeah, I'd maybe be like, oh, a little intimidated, you mm. know? Um, 
and because I was like on the first short film, I was like, oh, it was my first one. I was like, oh. Yeah. Right. What was it like shooting your first ever film? Were you nervy? Uh, yeah. So my first now my first ever short film was uh, uh, by these two guys, uh, Minas and um, and Jamal. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing was when I auditioned for them afterwards, when I got the, got the role again, I had to speak Cantonese, yeah. and I was actually very surprised that their script that they chose Cantonese. They were. Um, it's, it's not a student film, but they were like independent, but yeah. they were like young, right? Mm -hmm. And I was surprised they used Cantonese because actually they got a lot of influence from Hong Kong mm. triad film, the kind mm. of thing, okay, right? Okay, cool. And so when I was on set, everything was so new to me. I was like, oh, this is like, this is like great. And I was a little bit nervous because I wasn't sure how to like, mm. well, how should I be yeah. and things like that. Um, but the one thing is like, eventually that nerves went away as you get more reps and things like that. And then, oh, another tr funny trivia was then I found out they were from my high school. Oh, that's great. But they were like four or five grades below me. So we, we didn't uh, like cross yeah. paths. But um, so that was cool. So through acting, I meet a bunch of diverse people. And nice. they're, they become like one of my uh, good friends as well. And that's I met great. another good friend, uh, Helen Wang. She's very, she's from, uh, she was born in Shanghai. Hmm. But she immigrated to like Toronto when she was like five or six. And very she cool. was She's very knowledgeable about Chinese culture. She does nice. like like some calligraphy and stuff. Nice. And she's basically like a little younger sister to me. That's great. So through that, I managed to almost like connect with my roots more with yeah. acting. And then that allows me, again, when we're talking about like yeah. the objective of like being able to learn your language, is like now I have a reason to make sure I continue yeah. to learn Mandarin. Well, this is the big thing is like, it's like all this other stuff, this is what I found as well. So many good things, interesting people, great experiences, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. motivation has come out of trying to create stuff. Yeah, yeah. And either whether it's acting or putting on a podcast or whatever, you know, I, I would have met you. Exactly. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of good stuff that comes with the creative stuff. And, and I wouldn't have reached out to Ike actually, because yeah. I knew him from my high school, but we yeah. only spoke maybe total, like maybe like 10 minutes throughout our whole, because he was yeah, two yeah. grades below me. And we were still connected on Facebook, but I don't use Facebook anymore, but yeah, yeah. somehow we're still connect, connected on LinkedIn. And then when I was doing acting, I saw that he was like- He's out here in yeah, LA now. Here. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I, and I wasn't gonna contact him or anything, but when I was uh, um, going for this uh, short, um, film festival, yeah, I thought, let me just reach out to him. Yeah. I don't know how he would respond either, right? Yeah. So I was like, you know, what? if he doesn't respond, that's cool. Like, yeah, I, yeah. you know, uh, it'll it be nice to catch up just to see how his life has been after mm -hmm. high school. And then, and I was got, and I got to connect with him. And then he was like, hey, would you like to be on uh, be this on podcast? The, on and the podcast. and I was like, Jesse, I thought, yeah, I've seen this guy, you know, like he went viral. I saw it on <laughs> YouTube and everything. And now that was funny. So you had seen me before you came yeah, here. Yes, so I knew who you were. Oh, that's wow. Well, we had, a, we had, a, we had a, a, a fencer on a previous podcast as well that also had seen me before and yeah. was like a fan of the channel. And I was like, I guess. I guess the maybe the the channel's working better. Yeah, than you're I you're expected. big. I'm, you're I'm you're big, big man. man. Like I'm a big tea guy. <laughs> and I've said like your videos when I was like showing my friends. Hey, this is what's you know happening. You know, here's this interview with you know that's all these other channels and stuff like that. So yeah, I knew who you were like in 2020. Like yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, because you were saying you you saw an interview I did on the BBC. Yeah, you said right exactly. And I was like, finally, someone just presenting a different <laughs> perspective of what's going on. Uh, and uh, I was just like very happy and I was like, I was like, oh, finally someone like kind of like speaking, you know, because I didn't have a platform. I wasn't yeah, acting. Yeah. I was just like just watching. And then I used that to share to my other friends. Hey, yeah, this is you have like a, you have a white guy in, yeah. who has experience <laughs> in China saying all these things. And yeah. then I, I was interviewed over the pandemic a couple times because especially in the earlier days of the pandemic, when it was kind of thought of like as Asian news story mm -hmm. um, before it had really gotten to the whole world. Uh, people ask what's going on in China, and I had lots of friends in China. I was checking on WeChat every day. It yeah, was that's always what you said on wacky. BBC, yeah. yeah, and it's like, and and it was funny being on BBC, which is supposed to be this big news station. It was really shocking how they didn't have people who actually were like on top of what's actually going on in China mm -hmm, at the moment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's hard. It's information getting in and out of China is difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, but it's like. Um, it was, you know, and especially being a comedian too, it was always, I feel like it's useful to be able to bring a, a more people to people mindset yeah, onto yeah. the news. Because yeah. oftentimes it's like, you know, in, you know, the uh, the inflation is up 2.1 points and Chinese currency manipulation is blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's like, this is not what like regular people in China are thinking exactly. about. Like, let's manipulate our currency. <laughs> like no one says that in real life. Yeah, exactly. It's just completely, um, I wouldn't say it's made up, but it's like it's a choice that news media makes to make international news about, you know, big things yeah, as yeah, opposed yeah. to saying like, 
what about somebody else who's also struggling right now? Well, like, they need you know, to, they, they need clicks, right? They need clickbait headlines. And, and but the thing make is, money. people the people works too. Like this, I mean, it's 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 a little bit harder, but it's like I, I think it's just. Um, it's like the mechanization of the news. Yeah, yeah. The 24-hour news cycle, the fact you have to fill up shows. I think one of the healthiest things, ironically, about social media is like, on one hand, yeah, I'm sure the internet wants as many videos as I'm willing to post because they don't pay for me to make this stuff. I pay to make this stuff and then they get it for free. But, um, but on the other hand, it's like, if I don't have 24 hours of content, I don't need to pretend to have 24 exactly. hours yeah, of content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I can spend, like, you know, I make one video a day that might be 40 seconds. Yeah. But if that's what I got for you, then I can that's actually, all you that's all I got. Yeah. And I don't need to pretend to make up 23 hours, exactly. 59 minutes and You don't have to milk the content in yeah. order to get, you know. Whereas like viewers. a lot of, yeah, a lot of news places is essentially like they can't, they don't have resources to actually make 24 hours of news. Yeah. They can kind of run a bunch of entertainment shows that look like news shows, yeah, yeah. but are actually essentially just entertainment, entertainment shows. Yeah, exactly. And so, in, to some degree, I almost feel like it's more intellectually honest to say you're an entertainment show mm -hmm. that's talking about the world as opposed to pretending to be a news station. Yeah. And not, there's nothing particular against the BBC or whatever, but yeah, it's yeah. like the, you. This is kind of the feel as like this host who's sitting there and it looks like a news studio, and this guy's wearing a suit and he has yeah. a British accent. But I'm like, you haven't researched this at all. Right, exactly. Like, you know, exactly. like, it's pretty scary that you actually need the guest to come on and talk about this stuff. Like, you're not ready to know what the situation exactly. on the ground is. Um, I just remember, like, back in, like, the early 2000s when Jon yeah. Stewart went on, I think it's called Crossfire? Or Cross oh, yeah. And then that was, was brilliant. And then that's basically what you're saying now. It's like, yeah, just be, yeah, you're, you're, stop just, it. you're not, it's yeah. not, this is not a real debate show. This is not show. helping. This is just, it's really entertainment. Yeah. And Which then, is fine to be an entertainment show, but don't like this. And I think that this is part of the reason why I think news shows have become less and less respected. And weirdly enough, comedy, comedy has been have like been more, more, more respected exactly, yeah. is that comedy, while it's not news, um, admits its own shortcomings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, if I'm a dude, you know, Jon Stewart was like the show that goes before well, me is puppets pu making yeah, crank phone exactly, calls. Exactly, yes, exactly. Like yeah. that knowledge of what this situation is and and weirdly enough, you know, it's it's something in the West, it's not all been said, but the humility mm -hmm. to be able to say like, I can't bring you the news. Right, yeah. I can bring you my take on yeah, this story. Your perspective on this. And That's how journalism started. That's what it was mm -hmm. before it became a huge industry mm -hmm. was like individual journalists saying like, what can I get a hold yeah. of? Yeah. And, um, and a lot of it also was not necessarily even like, you know, they knew it wasn't necessarily true. Yeah. They're like, this is what we got before yeah. the newspaper exactly. came out. Exactly. But I think that that's sort of, um, that, that's one of the things that's made it a little bit more difficult to do this intercultural exchange is that the, um, it's, because the formal news media just will not make a story about China that doesn't have clickbaitiness exactly, to it, yeah. but it also doesn't have the skill of being true entertainers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you wind up in this middle ground yeah. where like all the news about China is horrible, yeah. and uh, and and they're kind of powerless to stop it yeah, from exactly. being horrible. Yeah. And it's uh, not just China either; it's like other countries as well. Yeah. Like every time you see like. He's talking about Mexico. It's like this is a huge, different, yeah. Mexico is a huge color. country, like you know, and, and the whole thing in America and the discourse is like the border. Well, that's right. not all that Mexican people think about. Yeah, exactly. The border, exactly. So it's um, yeah. So I, I guess, do you feel then that like kind of acting for you is not just about oh, I want to kind of have fun and 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 play, but it's also like this is a there's way like a responsibility. There's like a responsibility I feel with it as well, like yeah. to present uh, myself, and I would love to say like I could represent like. You know, mm -hmm. Chinese people, Canadian Chinese people, East Asian, South mm -hmm. East Asian in general. But mm -hmm. uh, like, I know that I remember reading on one of your blogs, one of the mm -hmm. interviews you said, he's like, you're a cultural ambassador. Yeah. So I feel like depending, like I would need to, like I want to present um, to to the world, like what, you know, like the, the positive aspects of mm -hmm. like Chinese culture and, mm -hmm. and even Canadian yeah, yeah. politeness and everything as well. And um, that's what I want to do is just be a culture ambassador for like Chinese Canadians, Canadian Chinese, you know, mm -hmm. uh, throughout the world. Um, and I realized that when I went to London uh, six years, uh, six years ago, when I, that's where I met my girlfriend in mm -hmm. Italy, London, UK. And I noticed that people there, they were surprised. They're like, 
they didn't think I was Chinese. Mm. I don't take offense to it. Mm. They're like, oh, are you Japanese or something? It's like yeah. never like Chinese. Or they think, are you mixed? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I think I look really Chinese. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that's when I realized, oh, they, they, they haven't been exposed to like Chinese people, at, at least like Canadian Chinese, because mm -hmm. I'm like, they're like, oh, you're so tall. I'm like, I'm not that tall, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And I was just, I was just like <laughs> scratching my head. I was like, what, what is all this like, um, compliments kind of coming from? Yeah, and yeah. I think that their idea of Chinese people is the ones that work in Chinatown or mm. something like that. Um, and they're just not, uh, privy to all the yeah. knowledge of like Chinese Canadians or even Chinese Americans who yeah, are yeah. like basically they like assimilated, you assimilated know, were like normal, like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so it's, that's why I'm like, I need to, uh, for acting, I was like the first. So when I did the first short film, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna post it all over. So oh, that's the yeah, the yeah. case where a lot of my friends don't know when I send it yeah, in the yeah. beginning is that I'm gonna post on social media. I'm gonna say this and this and this. And then eventually I realized, oh, I don't. I realized that I was trying to get maybe a little bit of validation from other people, but then I realized there's a responsibility. There's mm -hmm. actual art to everything that I didn't really have that thought going into it. So that's why I'm like, oh, I actually felt like I had imposter syndrome mm. in a way. And I'm like, okay, I'm not. And I wasn't represented at the time. Mm. I wasn't in the union at the time. So I'm like, oh, this is actually kind of scary, you know, like. Tell people to, you're out making that, that stuff. I'm doing acting and stuff. And and me knowing like the Chinese culture. So I'm like, what if yeah. I cannot represent my people mm. well in, in a way? Not that they're asking me to be their ambassador either. Yeah. But I know that when I travel, when I tell them I'm Chinese, I'm trying to also paint a different light when they think of like a Chinese person, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's when I, I realized, okay, maybe I should keep not post anything. So I'm nothing on my, for now anyways, yeah, yeah, yeah. on uh, about acting. Um, and when I'm ready, I will post yeah, like yeah. a final product. Um, um, but like for now, just keep it quiet just to make sure I, you know, I, I, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. don't, I, I represent my people well. I'm not always spamming. Well, I, think I would say there's, there's always a balance. I mean, I always, I felt a very similar way in China, like being, you know, a white actor, Jewish actor, whatever, in, in like a Lawai actor yeah. in China. Because I read that you said like, yeah, you're yeah. going to think that all Americans, you know, yeah, depending yeah, yeah, on how yeah. you are. Yeah, like, you know, the, and, and it was also part of the roles I picked. Like, I particularly didn't pick roles that were like, it shows Americans to just be straight up horrible exactly, people, yeah. badly written roles. I'm like, find somebody else to play that. It's yeah. not uh, like, you know, I think part of this is part of the reason why I really am more of a writer and creator and director at heart more than an actor. I love acting, mm -hmm. but I, I feel like when I play characters that I just like, this isn't me, yeah. so let somebody else act it. Yeah. It's not like it's a bad role. Yeah. It's just, I can't do that. Exactly. But, but in terms of the sharing thing, I think it's, uh, there are many ways to represent yourself and your community well. Yeah. And I think one of those ways, in, incidentally, for Asian performers, I've seen a lot of a lot of friends who are Asian filmmakers, performers, I think that the Asian performers have a lot harder time saying like, I was in this cool thing. I'm doing like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going out there. I'm like, what? look at me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's not to say that you need to be spamming, mm -hmm. but like, the way you go about sharing yourself is also a form of ambassador. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like to say, is it hard to kind of have the background that I have and, and tell people to look at me? Yes, but this is how I do it. Exactly. And so, so like, and, the, and then you kind of tie that knot where it was like, yeah, it was a struggle, but we came out the other side. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, if you get caught in the struggle forever, you know, you're also kind of missing out on exactly. that ambassadorship. So you know? that's that's why when I was getting new headshots, yeah, yeah, my headshot photographer was looking through my Instagram. He's yeah, like, yeah. you have nothing about uh, yeah. acting. Well, first of all, I my final, uh, yeah. I was in uh, Amazon Prime. Okay. Uh, I had like oh, nice. two lines, so that's, that's good. it's going to be released soon. So I'm waiting to make sure I survive the edit. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll post that as a final product. Yeah. Write, write a small blurb yeah. and then that's it. Um, yeah. And he said that you have nothing about acting. Like, yeah. you know, sometimes producers do look at your social media presence. Yeah, for sure. And I was like, really? And I was like, okay. But, but I, know, know, I know but how I would, to. I would, I would rephrase your thinking on this. It's not just the, because the thing about making a movie, as you know, like you're here uh, working on a film, like being part of a film that you shot two years ago. Yeah. The thing, the life of being a creator is long and it's continuous. And so it, you can't wait for just the days when the movie comes out true, to be an yeah, actor. True, yeah. You know, you're, it, you're, the way you go through the process is the, is the story. For the tea thing, you know, I can't just be like, hey, we have three new teas. And then people are like, oh, where'd you get it? Why does it come out? Like, people like seeing kind of like the, the process, the of, how process you go, yeah. of how you find the thing, how you make the decisions. Like, hey guys, like I'm, you know, uh, you, not that you need to make content yeah, on yeah, it, yeah, but like yeah. how, like, 
it was so important to you to do this project and there's another that's completely irrelevant to you. Why is that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That process of saying, you know, um, you don't need to, you know, you know spam all your friends, yeah, yeah. but like, you know, if you have a page where you're sharing what you're acting, you can be like, why did I pick this piece? Why did yeah. I not do that? That thinking is also helping other actors who may be a step underneath you, yeah. uh, who are just maybe even never gotten started because they haven't thought through some of the stuff you've already thought through point, just to get point. to the audition. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um, a, a lot of times it's like you never know what's going to be the thing mm -hmm. that makes it work. So. That's a, that, those are good points. And another thing why mm. I haven't really posted much is because uh, I want to surprise my friends. So oh, that's yeah. another aspect. So too. that's the thing too. But I, I think that like once you once a cat's out of the bag. Oh yeah, once then exactly the, exactly. The, the, so the, the other thing is like because I want to surprise my friends because they didn't know some know I'm acting, but a lot yeah. don't. I want to surprise them when I'm like, hey, let's watch this uh, TV series, oh, and yeah, then yeah. they see. Now you're playing the long game. Yeah, you're really I, I've been playing for the past. <laughs> For the past two, three years, and actually, yeah, I, had a, I had a commercial that I did, mm. and I was work. And when it came out, they were like, "Are you an actor now?" I was like, "No, they just like they cast yeah, anybody." Yeah, yeah. Well, you I, think all the Asian people look alike? Yeah, you and that's what I said. Like, oh, I'm like, <laughs> they're like, no, they're like. I was like, wait, just because he's Asian, so you yeah, think that's yeah. me? And you're like, like, no, ga you're gaslighting all. Yeah, your exactly. Friends. They're like, no, that's your hand. That's your mannerism. I know that's you. Gotta be you. And then I was like, oh damn, okay. And I was like, and they're like, are you an actor now, Jin? And I'm, are you a model now? I was like, I was like, no, no, no. They just hire anybody. But yeah, once that's funny. Once I show a couple of friends the the TV series I'm in, which should be releasing soon I, yeah. I don't know when but yeah. amazon prime yeah. then I w i'm gonna record the reaction that'll be good and that'll then that's great. like something that'll for me like memories those are that'll like gonna be good. be good like uh that's great yeah well good. best of luck with it um yes. we're basically running out of time but before i uh let you go i have one last question to ask you yes. which is what are the Chinese comedians making of the drake kendrick beef oh my god um <laughs> Because I hear a lot of Canadians' opinion, but I, the Chinese Canadians specifically, I don't know what they think about this beef. They're, oh my, oh my goodness. So the CB, yeah, the Chinese Canadians, like my generation, were like, we're, it's tough because we, well, at least for me, I do support Drake because he brought Toronto mm -hmm. so much uh, publicity and marketing that when everywhere I travel before this beef happened, they're like, are you from Toronto? Oh, it's sick. Oh, I want to go visit, yeah. you know? <laughs> and um, there was a restaurant in Chinatown. Mm -hmm called New Ho King, I guess mm -hmm. shout out to New Ho King now, um, where Kendrick referenced that restaurant and now it's super popular because uh, they have like also a Kendrick special. That's funny. For me, I didn't like that because I'm like, yo, you need to support yeah, your you boy. Yeah, you gotta be with you Drake. You gotta support yeah. your boy. Like make it a Drake special or if you, I don't know what they serve. Maybe the Kendrick special is some like garbage like dish. <laughs> I don't know. If that's the case, then at least I have a little bit of respect for them, you know, but yeah. For the most part, it also made local Chinese news as well because oh, yeah? it, because it referenced New Ho King. That's funny. But uh, for my friends, they were like, "Oh, now we, when we come to LA, we cannot wear uh, not like not all my yeah, friends, yeah. but some of them were like, we cannot wear any OVO or like anything Toronto." But for me, I went to the Dodgers <laughs> game yesterday. Yeah. I wore my East York, which is yeah. like a borough in Toronto. I wore my Blue Jays hat. I didn't even care, but no one bothered me yeah. anyways. I wore my Scarborough Shooting Stars uh, t-shirt underneath. I was just like repped up, like decked up in Toronto. Yeah. But no one really. I feel like yeah. no one really cares. But. It was like a fun, like my friends were all talking about it. They're all like, oh, you know, like this is, this yeah. is not good luck for us. And then, <laughs> and then I was like, oh man, I, to me, I was like, at least we still have the weekend. Cause he's yeah, from, yeah. He's from yeah. Scarborough, he's from yeah. Toronto. But it was, yeah, for that month, we did take an L, yeah. but, but now, you know, after that, people, people are still gonna listen to Drake. Yeah, sure. People are still, you know, uh, and for, for us, like, I feel like once it blows over, you know, at the end of the day, who wins is them too. They, yeah, yeah. they, they get the money. They've got a lot of publicity. Publicity, out of the whole thing. publicity. Yeah. So, uh, that's, funny. that's a good question. I can't, uh, yeah. I can't believe you asked me that. I was going to say, I was like, uh, especially now you being in LA, I was like, oh, can you go around with all the drinks? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, don't be too loud about that in South Central, but, yeah. uh, oh, no, yeah, it, yeah. it'll be, it, it's great. I mean, everybody's, I think. Even amongst the beef, I think everybody has, has taken it with the right amount of yeah, seriousness. Yeah, I, I think so, <laughs> so too. Not so, some, yeah, yeah. of course, some are like too serious. I'm like, they, yeah. you know, they just live on the internet. But for the people who are like more yeah. in the middle, it's like, oh, damn, that happened. And then next But this cycle. is how I know that Drake lost the fight is that I went to Canada and I was in Vancouver and anybody asked about Drake, it's, oh, 
Oh, really? Yeah, they're like, mm, I, we want to we wanna support our boy, but mm, oh, <laughs> like it wasn't. Okay, okay. Yeah, but anyway, I was in China when that whole thing happened, so it was really did it, funny. Did it make the news oh, in China? Oh, it made the news immediately in China. Like, what? every everybody was talking, like, as one video drops, and then all of my Chinese friends are sharing it, and they're like, oh, look at this one, look at that. Damn, like, I didn't know it reached China. This, oh, yeah, the, the, the beef reached China. And I remember watching this, and my I was thinking, like, I should make some sort of, like, I was going to make a joke about... Uh, being in China and talking to somebody off screen and the joke would be like, Jay Cole is here in China, oh. avoiding the whole <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he, yeah, he was... He just, he dipped. And then like, everyone's like, where's Jay Cole? And the joke was going to be like, hey, Jay Cole, like, it's good to see you in Beijing. Like, yeah. why are you here? I don't he know. got flack for that. And then afterwards, they're like, oh, he did a smart move by not uh, anyway. being part of the beef. Anyway, uh, I don't think we've talked about rap on the show before, so this is fun. Oh, anyway, we, we do have to get going. It's been great to have you here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very uh, much. Where can, can people I, follow you? Yeah. Um, my Insta- I only have Instagram. It's uh, the Overseas Gin. And I picked that because it's Hai Wai. You know, mm-hmm. Hai Wai Hard Inside. It's mm-hmm. like Hai Wai Gin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also to play like the show that maybe I'll be in if I don't get edited out. It's on Amazon Prime Video. It's called Cruel Intentions. Great. Uh, I have like just like two lines on it, but it's a good start and I'm very proud of that. So hopefully it survives the edit and then you guys can see it. That'd be great. And then my friends will be able to see it and then I can let them know, that, hey, I'm an actor, you know? Yeah, so. exactly. It's great. So, well, I'm, I'm glad to have you, Jen, on. We've had all sorts of, of guests at various uh, stages of their life and career and everything, but it's, you know, good tea people. Good tea people. I'm always, I always like, it's a big, uh, like, you know, green flag on a person whenever they really care about Chinese food. Mm. Like, the, if you dig into it, that's good. Um, for people who are uh, watching the show for the first time and made it to the end, thank you so much. If, if you don't know somehow, I do run an online tea shop. All of the stuff that we have on here, the tea pets, the teas. In the first half, we had Sister Eyes Everyday Red Tea. The second half, we had the 2010 uh, Reserve, Dwayne 2010 Reserve Show Puar. All this stuff is on the site, and the best way you can support the channel is by getting really great tea for yourself. Uh, JesseCHouse.com, we ship everywhere in the world. And depending on when this is open, our EU and UK warehouses might be open as well. They're planning on opening in November. Uh, So if you're in the EU and UK and you don't want to pay customs fees and you want like fast shipping, really good tea, um, we're we're really trying to change the game there. I've spent all year getting that ready, so I'm very excited for it. uh, thank you again so much for coming. Thank you. Shout out to Toronto, Canada, and <laughs> yeah. Torino, where my girlfriend lives. And uh, you got shout outs on you. shout outs. I'm Jesse. And I'm Yijin. I'll see you guys next week. Cheers.